Hi girls, today I'm going to be going over English 1 Semester 1 Week 1 Activity LC 1.5 Language Checkpoint Understanding Verb, Voice, and Mood. So our learning targets for this activity are to 1. Understand verb, voice, and mood, just like the title says, and 2. Revise writing to correct inappropriate shifts in verb, voice, and mood. Okay? So reviewing verb, voice, and mood. To begin, verbs are the engines of sentence. They express action. For example, run, jump, think, or a state of being like is or was. I know that a lot of people have confusion with that one, so it would be something like, um, Isabella is beautiful. The verb there would be is, um, which doesn't sound like something you do, how do you is something, but it's a state of being verb. So whenever you think of a verb, think of it as one of two things, either a word of action or a word of state of being, okay? And that'll make things a lot simpler when you're looking for verbs. So verbs have qualities called voice and mood that provide additional information. So since the activity is going to be about voice and mood, I'm going to go ahead and highlight here where they've got bolded voice and mood, okay? So verb voice refers to whether the verb is active or passive. So you guys have definitely heard the term passive aggressive, right? That's when you sit back and kind of like be aggressive, but sort of in a way where it's not directly at the person. Kind of like when you're talking about somebody or, or mumbling under your breath, that kind of thing is passive aggressive. So the same thing here, when a verb isn't the one um, doing the action, or when the subject isn't the one doing the action, but having the action done to them, they're being passive. So um, when we're writing, we usually want to use the active voice, and that's what this part of the lesson is going to be about. So in a sentence using active voice, the subject of the sentence performs the action expressed by the verb. In a sentence using passive voice, the subject of the sentence receives the action. So here is an example of active voice. Eugenia Collier wrote the short story, Marigolds. So we have the subject, and I'm going to underline the subject, Eugenia Collier, Collier. And then we have our verb, and I'm gonna put a box around our verb, she wrote, okay? So she is the one who wrote it. So since the subject is the one doing the action, then that's active voice. So the short story Marigold was written by Eugenia Collier. In this case, the subject is the short story Marigolds. That's the complete subject. And then the verb was, was written. And the way you could tell that this is passive is it uses was before it and written, which is um, a different tense than wrote, okay? It's past participle, I think. So with active voice, you're directly saying something. With passive voice, it's indirect. Um, you want to be active because it's more direct and less wordy than passive voice. You should use active voice in most cases. But in some cases, the passive voice may be preferable. So for instance, if a writer wants to emphasize the recipient of the action or may want to avoid naming who or what performs an action. So for instance, um, if you are wanting to report that somebody's phone got stolen, um, you don't know who stole it. So you could say somebody stole so-and-so's phone, which is active where somebody is the um, subject and stole is the verb. Or you could say so-and-so's phone was stolen by someone. Or so-and-so's phone was stolen so that we know whose phone that we need to be looking for, so on and so forth. And that would be an example of passive where it's kind of useful. But most of the time, I would say like nine times out of 10, you're going to want to be using active. So here, verb move, verb, I can't say that, verb mood expresses a writer's or speaker's attitude. Indicative mood, and this is something that we talked about in the previous lesson if you watched that, indicative mood is the most common mood and it's used to make statements or ask questions. Imperative mood is used to give a command or make a request, like do your homework or please pick up some milk for me from the grocery store. 
Subjunctive mood is used to express doubt about something contrary to, or something contrary to a uh, fact. So indicative, here's an example. The years have taken me worlds away from that time and place. So we have, have taken as our verb, and we know it's indicative because it's describing something that happened just straight off. Imperative mood is take me away from this place, meaning it's telling somebody to do something. So it's saying take me away instead of have taken. And then the subjunctive mood often uses if or I wish or something along those terms. And so we're changing it to I wish I were in any other place. And here we have the subjunctive. So those are the three main moods. I want you to um, go over that again carefully so that you understand it. Um, and the way that you could try to think about it is indicative mood indicates something that happened. Indicative, indicate. It indicates something that happened. Imperative means like your, think about an emperor, even though that's spelled differently. An emperor makes imperative statements to the people who follow him, meaning he tells them what to do. So imperative, emperor. A subjunctive mood, um, I wish I were in any other place, I, I don't really have anything to tell you for a mnemonic device there. But um, just remember that the three are indicative, imperative, and subjunctive. And if you have the other two down, then you'll have the third down by process of elimination. All right. So exploring mood, uh, exploring verb voice. Number one, writers use active voice most of the time. Read the following sentence, which uses active voice. Then briefly describe why you think the actor or the writer chose the active voice. I destroyed the perfect yellow blooms. So you're going to be considering why you think the author chose to say this. Um, I'll give you a hint. Think about the role of responsibility here. Think about that when you're answering this question. Number two says, now read the sentence which is written in passive mood. How does the passive mood change the meaning and effect of the sentence? The perfect yellow blooms were destroyed. So we're changing the, we're trying to examine how the sentence was changed from the previous one to this one and describe um, how the effect of the sentence changed. Avoiding unnecessary shifts in voice. So writers may choose to use active and passive voice for different effects, but they should avoid unnecessary shifts in voice. So look at this sentence from a student's essay about marigold and underline the verbs. Remember, your verbs are going to be either things that you can do or state of being verbs, okay? So the narrator recalls her childhood and the dust, dust is remembered. So we have two verbs that you're looking for. Now, what do you notice about the verbs in these two clauses? Ignore the part with the partner, we're digital learning, so that's not something we're doing. But look at the sentence and make an observation about the verb's voice. So in the first half of the sentence, it uses one type of voice. The second half of the sentence uses the other type of voice. What I want you to do is figure out what voice was used where and make an observation about that. So exploring verb mood, number five. The indicative mood is used most often, but there are specific uh, situations when other verb moods, moods are useful. Read the following sentence, which is in the imperative mood, and describe briefly when you would use this mood. Come over here. So you're just describing briefly when you would use that mood, the mood of um, commanding somebody to do something or requesting somebody to do something. Now read this sentence, which contains a bold-faced verb in the subjunctive mood. Briefly describe when you would use this mood. If I were Miss Lottie, I would have been sad. So when would you use that move, the subjunctive? Now, avoiding unnecessary shifts in mood. Number seven says, look at this sentence from a student's essay about marigolds and underline the verbs. So all you're doing for number seven is underlining the verbs. Remember, you could have state of being verbs or you can have action verbs. Then eight says, what mood are these verbs in? Ignore the thing about with a partner, but write a new sentence that uses the same mood. So figure out what mood out of subjunctive, imperative, or indicative 
that sentence uses and then write a sentence of your own using the same move. Number nine says, look at this sentence from a student's essay about marigold. Underline the verbs. Think about the narrator's situation. Imagine her feelings. What mood are these verbs in? So now you're going to write a new sentence that uses that same mood. Revising. Read the following passage and revise the underlined ver words as needed to correct inappropriate shifts in voice or mood. If the sentence has no unnecessary shifts, choose no change. So you have these three sentences, you're reviewing them, you're revising the underlined words um, in order to correct inappropriate shifts if they are there. If the sentence has no unnecessary shifts, write no change. So check your understanding. Imagine you are writing a class, editing a classmate's writing and you notice these sentences. What would you do if you are in the narrator's shoes? You could apologize or replanting the garden could be considered. So write an explanation to your classmate so that they understand how to correct the unnecessary shifts. Add an item to your editor's checklist. I don't know what they're talking about there, so ignore that one. Practice. Using what you have learned about verb usage in this lesson, revisit what you wrote for the writing prompt in activity 1.5. So remember, that was the one about the pizza. Be sure to one, check for appropriate verb, voice, and mood, making sure you didn't do any weird switches. And two, revise any inappropriate shifts between voices and moods. So that's what you're doing for um, the practice section. And that will complete your week one of your springboard work for English One Semester One. I hope that this um, tutorial has been informative. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me through um, texting, emailing, whatever your preferred method of communication is, I'm available for you. Um, thanks for watching. Have a great day.